This weekend, we welcome Dr. Philip Bogus, who is really one of the up and coming stars in the Austrian movement worldwide. Philip is a professor of economics at the University Rey Juan Carlos in Spain. He studied under Jesus Huerto de Soto, and he's written, I think, the most important Austrian book on the Euro entitled The Tragedy of the Euro. We discuss both the history and the possible future of the Euro. We discuss what's changed and what hasn't changed at the ECB under Mario Draghi. We discuss the growing nationalist sentiments that are sweeping across Europe as they relate to currencies. We discuss German nostalgia, so to speak, for the Bundesbank. And we discuss finally how the ECB has effectively monetized the European sovereign debt crisis. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mises Weekends. I am your host, Jeff Deist, and today we are speaking with Dr. Philip Bogus from Madrid. Philip, how are you today? I'm very fine, Jeff. Thank you. Well, it is good to speak to you again. Uh, let me open by saying that I think your book, The Tragedy of the Euro, is really a very important contribution to the Austrian discussion, so to speak, of central banks and monetary policy. I saw one uh, commenter on our Mises.org website say that your book was to the ECB what Rothbard's Against the Fed was to the Fed. Actually, I wanted to uh, title the book first, The Case Against the ECB, but but then I chose the tragedy of the euro because because it was, yeah, my, my idea was to do something similar as Rothbard did with the Fed. Phil, the book really reads like a novel and it's an excellent, concise history of the ECB. But I'd like to ask you, have there been any changes to the euro or to the ECB in the four years since you wrote the book that would alter your central thesis? No, actually, the developments are, are what you would forecast on base on basis of, of the book that they mainly that the ECB did or is doing anything to save the euro. That the euro is a political project. The last, uh, let's say, uh, Germans were pushed out of the EC, ECB. Uh, the the last Germans in, in the tradition of the Bundesbank because they were too they did not want to print money fast enough as others thought would be necessary, <laughs> so it has been become more more political. Yeah, it's it's an inter more and more it becomes obvious that the ECB is an instrument of politics as I already had had uh, had claimed in the book. So it's it, it just what I th what I thought would happen. It's interesting the way you explain the euro as a purely political project rather than a true currency. And of course, Mises had a radically different conception of what money ought to be. It was uh, basically uh, an attempt to get rid of uh, the Bundesbank, the German central bank, because the German central bank was the central bank in Europe with uh, that was inflating less due to the uh, inflation phobia in the German population, which is caused by the hyperinflation of 1923, the experience of that and the experience of the currency reform after World War II, when basically one generation experienced that they lost all their savings uh, twice. So this led then to the Bundesbank, which were, of course, also just a money printing machine to <laughs> keep up the government, but it did so less. It did so less uh, um, than the other European countries. Which meant that if the other European countries, like, let's say, France or Italy, if they wanted to maintain the exchange rate more or less stable to the German mark, they had to follow the uh, the monetary policy of the Bundesbank. So if they wanted to finance their own governments, the French government, the Italian government, or, or basically the orders go the other way around, no? The, the French government spends, has a deficit, and tells, tells uh, the uh, central bank to finance it. So if they have a high deficit, uh, the French um, central bank would finance it, and then there would be a depreciation, devaluation of the French franc. And this is, of course, very embarrassing for politicians. So the euro was the attempt to get rid of this Im implicit discipline that the Bundesbank was putting on European monetary policy and to get the hand on it. And we have seen that this was a very successful move. So, Philip, was the euro in part conceived as an instrument for blunting German economic power? <clears throat> yeah, in, in, in some sense, no. In the, there's this one anecdote that I also tell in, in the book that there was at the, at the end of the 80s, um, uh, 
discussions between uh, German politicians or diplomats and French ones because the French had uh, stationed short uh, short range nuclear weapons at the German border that was supposedly it was they were they, they could only go to Germany <laughs> so supposedly if the, if the Russians would invade but of course it's not very nice to have the short range nuclear weapons on the borders so the Germans asked uh, if the, if the, the there could be something done about that and then the French answered well, uh, let's talk first about the German atomic bomb. And then the Germans said, well, surprised. Well, we don't have an atomic bomb. You, you, you know, we are not even allowed to have one. And then the French replied, well, we are talking about the German mark. It seems like there is still this German collective guilt hardwired in Germans that compels them to accept whatever sort of globalist planning comes down, whether from the ECB or from Brussels, for instance. Well, it's less and less so in the younger gen generations. But of course, this guilt uh, complex played an important role also in the direction of the euro and uh, the euro crisis. You, you have to imagine that the politicians that are now uh, in uh, controlling German politics, they are the generation that was were born at the end of the war or in the 1950s, shortly after the war. And for them, they have still this complex that their fathers or parents were involved no, in Nazi Germany. So they still have this uh, complex. And of course, in the media, it's also very strong uh, still. So it's, I, I think it's unimaginable that the euro would have survived without this guilt complex, because the, there are so many disadvantages for Germany to keep the whole thing up uh, and to finance all, all these bail bailouts that I don't think it would have been possible without this guilt complex. Well, has living and teaching and working in Spain these last few years uh, changed your perception of the euro and the uh, eurozone? No, I, I mean you get the two, you get you get the perspective perspective of Spain. No, my academic teacher Walter de Soto makes makes a case in favor of the euro actually, um, because he says it imposes some kind of discipline on on governments. Uh, and he's in some sense, uh, he has a point, because without the euro, what would have happened in 2007, 2008, would have been that the, Fran that the Spanish peseta, they would have devalued it. Uh, and they would have just continued with their horrible policies. And now at least they have done some, some small reforms here. It's not enough, but, but okay. Philip, do you think the ECB eventually will have to prevent Eurozone countries from issuing their own sovereign debt going forward? This could be, in, in some sense, we have already. You know, and this would be a nominal thing, more or less, because in some sense, we have already a, a Europeanization of, of, of bonds. You know, if the ECB is basically guaranteeing for, for all, all, all sovereign uh, European bonds, because they say we will do anything to save the euro and we will buy any amount necessary to save uh, the project. So in some sense, we don't or they don't need euro bonds to survive. It would be more, more I guess, a confidence or psychological thing to say, hey, we really, we really want to do this forever. And it's... Uh, it's the past dependencies. It's more difficult to 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 get rid of euro bonds once you have it than to get rid of the ECB policy of unlimited financing. But it would it's not necessary. In 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 fact, we already have we have uh, adept socialization in the eurozone. So the ECB has all of its various national constituencies. The U.S. Fed, of course, has 50 political constituencies in the form of our 50 states. Now those states do issued bond debt, but they don't each have their own central bank. Yeah, uh, th th this was the one different until now that the Fed didn't didn't buy you no know, state debt or uh, municipal municipal debt. Uh, this is was why I called it the tragedy of the euro because there are several independent governments: France, Germany, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and so on, that can use one central bank. Uh, to finance the expenditures, which is the tragedy of the commons. And you, you can imagine if you're if you're politicians, it's very nice because you can externalize part of your costs. No, if you you buy votes with government expenditures, you promise big projects, you spend it, you have a deficit, and part of the cost uh, is uh, paid through the printing press because the ECB buys uh, or, or the in the eurozone is actually the banks buy 
uh, the bonds and then they give them to the ECB as collateral for new loans. So the ECB only indirect, uh, indirectly holds them. So it's a way to monetize these debts. And the cost is, of course, that the purchasing power of the euro is lower than it would have been otherwise. So the, the nice thing then for a Greek politician, for example, is you can externalize the costs of your government expenditures in form of a loss in the purchasing power of the euro on foreigners. You know, because the purchasing power of the euro also uh, loses a, 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 or goes down all over Europe, in Germany, France, Italy, and so on. So Italians, Germans, and Frenchmen are paying indirectly for the Greek deficit, for the Greek government spending. And Greeks and uh, and French, Germans, and Italians, they don't won't vote in Greek elections. So you see the incentives for the Greek politicians, that they, they can externalize the cost of their spending on people who don't vote in their country. As a result, doesn't the ECB operate to increase nationalism and resentment among the Eurozone countries, despite the supposed goal of harmonization? Yeah, this is one point that I make uh, in my book, you know, uh, one teaching or that already uh, Frederick Bastiat uh, um, showed and the Austrians repeat again and again, free trade leads, leads to harmonious harmony, cooperation, hmm, to peace. But this is... Uh, this is broken up through the euro system because it allows one nation to live or one political class to live on costs of the um, people of of other nations no the the, the, the greek uh, the greeks for example the greek government they they had very early pensions very high government uh, spending very high many many government employees and all this spending was paid through the printing press indirectly and all other Europeans were paying for it. Of course, nobody or almost no one understands this monetary redistribution that was going on or that is going on. But suddenly it came all to the open with the European debt crisis, sovereign debt crisis, because suddenly markets doubted that the ECB would finance without limits the Greek government and the Greek government needed a bailout. And once it needed a bailout, suddenly, it opened the eyes to many people that was going on, what was going on, on namely, namely a redistribution between different European countries. Right? And people don't like redistributions, so mostly, mostly those that um, that pay them, and also people who receive these redistributions, they get get accustomed to it. And and once you reduce their benefits, they also start to protest and they they start to burn. German flags and Athens and so on. And the Germans complain that the Greeks are lazy because they understand that they partially uh, finance the Greek welfare state. So the harmonious cooperation between Europeans is broken up and there are conflicts that otherwise would not exist. And there's a new nationalism. Well, in the U.S., after the 2008-2009 crash, we at least have an audience for Austrian business cycle theory. I wouldn't call it a mainstream view here, but we have an audience. Is anyone in Europe even considering or, or talking about Austrian business cycle theory with respect to the euro? Well, no, not so many. We had one German a member of the German parliament, Frank Schaeffler, of, of the liberals, who is an Austrian, and he talked about it, but he was an exception and he was not re-elected either. So does Merkel face any challenges from even a faintly libertarian political party, something akin to UKIP in Germany? Well, of course, we have this alternative for Germany, AfD, that is uh, challenging Merkel's bailout policy, but they are not based on Austrian economics. Uh, they are based on order liberalism mainly, and uh, yeah, they don't understand Austrian business cycle theory. Mm. They are just, I actually, yeah, yeah they, they want the German mark back. They, they think that this would be the optimal solution, so to speak. So they don't want gold or they don't want currency competition. They just want to get rid of the bailouts and the German guarantee of other other debts, which is a step in the right direction, but they don't have the uh, theoretical background necessary to do uh, thorough reform. Philip, you wrote a paper for the Wolfson Prize entitled How to Exit the Euro. And in that paper, you lay out some practical steps about how an orderly exit from the euro back to sovereign solid currencies might occur. Uh, among those ideas are an idea that Ron Paul has championed here in the U.S., the repeal of legal tender laws. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on your paper. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are several options. You, you can do it uh, more orally or, or less l less orally. Eh? One way would be, of course, also to introduce a gold euro that I also proposed in the paper, which is we just ta take we, we take all the gold that is in, in European central banks and we back the euro with it 100%. Of course, there are different ratios. For example, Germany might have, or and Italy might have a higher ratio of gold uh, in relation to the outstanding currency that they issued on their balance sheet. So um, there might, to get the ratio the same, so there might be necessary some redistribution, some gold loans between the different central banks, but then you would have a 100% gold-backed euro. And of course, all the target two problems and so on, they would be also uh, gold loans. So this would then, and then you could open uh, the thing from, for competition, repealing legal tender laws, and so on. Philip, one last question. One of your mentors, Dr. Guido Holzman, has written a very important book where he discusses the cultural aspects of fiat money. I was wondering if you could speak a bit about how the euro has affected European culture, not just its politics or monetary policy. Yeah, the, the euro has uh, accelerated the process of uh, of uh, an ever higher indebtedness, the, the ECB uh, lowered interest rates to to levels never never seen before. They triggered bubbles. Um, then they uh, financed bailouts between countries, lowering interest rates to to zero. And with uh, zero interest rates, of course, you have very important cultural implica implications. So one is that the tendency of ever higher debt having there's an incentive, as, as Guido Hülsmann explains, to have to go early in de into debts in your life and to go into high debts uh, because prices will keep rising. So if you if you just save in cash, you will lose. So it's your incentive, of course, to go in into debt early in your life and uh, and also um, into high debts to acquire early um, um, assets that uh, keep rising in value. So this, of course, uh, is, is keeping on with the euro. And now we get also the cultural, cultural implications of a zero interest rate policy and the bailouts. You know, the bailouts leads to moral hazard and the zero interest rate policy threatens, uh, I would say, a kind of life model that has been traditional for, you know, for the middle class uh, worldwide, that if you are thrifty, if you save, if you invest, at some point of your life, you will you can make the decision to retire, and you can be independent. You have acqu accumulated a wealth that make you independent. So this life model of uh, if you work hard and if you save, then you get independent and wealthy. This is threatened by the zero interest rate policies, uh, not only in the eurozone, but worldwide, because uh, people are. The savings of people are worth less, less and less right? because inflation is eating up uh, the savings and the savings of the people are basically used to finance the government deficits, uh, which is basically they, they, they are burned. You know? they, they, they are burned. They, they, are, they are lost for, forever. So many people may be faced with uh, poverty in their old age and they may be, become ever more dependent on, on, on the state. So they are self-reliance were self-reliance and self-responsibility is shaken by this policy monetary policy well the situation you described sounds an awful lot like america dr philip august thank you very much for a fascinating interview ladies and gentlemen have a great weekend <laughs>